we'll just start uh, as yeah. soon as I introduce you. Um, I don't know if yeah, yeah. you're going to come back with something. I'm already part of it. Okay. Okay. Great. So so uh, so yeah. So I'm very happy to have Kuldeep Neil uh, join us for today's talk. Um, uh, to introduce him, I tried looking at his bio. And then I very quickly decided that was not a good idea because it will take me the next 10 minutes to kind of tell you what all in his bio. Let's just say that Tulip is somebody who received a lot of awards for teaching, for best paper, for research, best thesis, and so on. So let's just cut that short. Tulip is somebody who works uh, um, uh, on the intersection of formal methods and AI, which is an area I believe that he has pioneered as well and, and, and you know has kind of been developing as he goes along. Um, he's going to talk, about today about, uh, talk to us today about a very interesting bit of work. It has a bit of history to it. And, you know, Kuldeep, you can tell us more about it. So, yeah, welcome. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, Oman, for uh, hosting. Um, good morning, everyone. So, I'm very excited to talk about um, um, this algorithm that uh, we designed. Uh, this, this was joint work with Sora Chakrabarti, who is at Indian Statistical Institute in Kolkata, and Anvi Vinod Chandran, who is at University of Nebraska Lincoln. And uh, after we published uh, the series of papers, which culminated in the ESA paper, where we um, have kind of uh, the core version of the algorithm. Um, I also happened to meet Don Knuth, who got interested into the algorithm. So he naturally improved the algorithm, and I'll be presenting the improved version of the algorithm. As you can see, I have only 16 slides. So please ask questions as uh, we um, at any point in the talk. Most of the time, when one tries to give the talk, uh, the idea is to give some high-level overview. Uh, of the algorithm or the proof. In this case, I'm going to try to dive deep into both the algorithm as well as the proof. Uh, one motivation for giving this talk is to convince some of you to teach uh, the algorithm I'm going to discuss in your undergraduate classes. So please do ask questions uh, as we go along. Um, okay, so with that as the backdrop, here is the uh, problem that I want to discuss. So we have a stream of uh, elements that come in. Um, let's say every num every element is a number between one and n. Um, we know the length of the stream. It's uh, m elements that are going to come in. Um, maybe one way to think about the motivation is that on your website, you want to have a small box that says that how many distinct uh, visitors who have visited your website. So the problem here is that you have a stream of uh, visitors and at the end, or maybe at any point in the stream, you want to know how many unique elements you have seen in the stream. Mm -hmm. This is also called the zeroth frequency moment. Uh, so traditionally it's uh, denoted as F0. So the problem of F0 is to figure out the cardinality of the set of elements we have seen in the stream. Here's a simple example to make sure all of us are on the same page. So here's a stream. The length of this stream is eight. So in particular, we have eight elements. And uh, what are the, uh, how many distinct elements we see here? Well, the set of elements we see here are one, two, and four. So the number of distinct elements is three. Any questions at this point? Right, so, well, it turns out that if you had to compute an exact S, uh, number, uh, then there is not much you can do other than just maintain the hash table of all the elements you see. So for a long time, the focus has been on getting approximate estimate. In particular, the approximation we want to talk about is epsilon delta approximation. So uh, we are interested in uh, computing an estimate, which is within one plus minus epsilon of the exact um, count, uh, which is F0, with probability at least one minus delta. And the user gets to specify the epsilon and delta. Kuldeep Rahul Vajay here. Question? Yeah. So yes, yes, please. When you're trying to find the exact number, yeah. 
why can't you just keep a counter that as soon as a new element shows up you just increment it by one what's the difficulty in that uh yes so in that case uh the focus here is the space complexity how much space we have to maintain okay and uh, if maintain such a hash table then we'll have to have a space of uh, linear in this size in the worst right. case All right. and uh, yeah so therefore there are two things we want to optimize one is the space and the other is every time uh, it takes it will take us some time to process an element and that's called update time complexity so we would like to optimize space and update time complexity and um, the algorithm that we are going to focus on, on our uh, are the epsilon delta approximate uh, algorithms uh, kuldeep uh, just want to clarify so there you can only make one pass on the stream right yes so i think exactly so if you think about at every point you see an element and at the end or at any point in the stream you want to know how many elements we have seen in so far okay all right so well this is a very classical Pul problem this has been yeah pralad here one more question actually so do do you know, does the algorithm know upfront the number of elements in the stream or it can keep updating this this m uh, the version of algorithm i'm going to discuss today uh, we know a priori the uh, value of n okay it can be there's a small uh, change to the algorithm where we can get uh, we we don't have to know m a priori and there won't be any dependence on m as well Okay. 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 But today we are just going to know that M is given to us in advance. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, this I turns out to be very. Yeah. Uh, you said M is not known, but what about N? Is that uh, both are known to us in advance? Okay. Um, in the variant I'm going to discuss today, both M and N are known to us in advance. What is n? M is the alphabet size. M is the screen size, and n is the alphabet size. Yeah. So n is really, I mean, n you have to kind of know because that's the representation of every element. And uh, uh, m, the variant I'm going to discuss today, m is known, but it's um, you know it can be changed uh, to have no dependence on that. Okay, so it turns out this, uh, the problem that I talked about, uh, it's a very well studied problem. In fact, uh, the seminal work of Flazel and Martin designed the first counters. And uh, then Elon, Matthias and Skeddy studied the problem and other frequency moments for which they were awarded Gerdell Prize. And since then, there has been a continuous stream of lots of work that has uh, been on this problem. And in many ways, we kind of know the optimal complexity. We know the algorithms with the optimal time as well as space complexity. And the space complexity that turns out to be is, uh, order of log n. So remember, n is the entire universe of elements we have. So log n is the representation of every element plus one over epsilon square log one by del delta. The only issue with these algorithms is, uh, well, <clears throat> the practically efficient algorithms um, that are the analysis of those is beyond the graduate classroom. So often nobody, most of the places you don't even teach to the, uh, the analysis to the graduate students. And the analysis of these practically efficient algorithms is under the assumption of perfect random hash functions. The theoretically efficient algorithms are taught in graduate classroom, but they don't work in practice. So there's no point in implementing them. And uh, that's a bit of a um, unsatisfactory situation because here is a problem, a very beautiful, simple problem. And uh, we are not able to teach an algorithm and the analysis that one can go and implement as well. 
Uh, so one can experience both uh, the beauty of the problem as well as uh, its power in practice. So I'm going to discuss today a very simple algorithm which has the time and space complexity that's logarithmic in N as well as logarithmic in M. So there is an additional overhead of log M. And uh, much more importantly, uh, the algorithm I'm going to talk about is going to rely on very simple basic data structures. Um, it can be, uh, in my view, can be taught to an undergraduate in classroom. And algorithm also turns out to be practically efficient. It's worth remarking at this point that uh, the theoretically efficient algorithms often rely on uh, the notion of limited independence hash functions, so which is also what makes it uh, tricky to introduce them to lower level undergraduate class, uh, classrooms. So what we are going to talk about today does not rely on any independent hash functions, and it's going to just rely on very simple data structures. Uh, the paper, entire paper is about five pages uh, that includes abstract and bibliography. If you remove them, then we are down to three and a half pages. And if you remove the mention of Chernoff bond, then it's about three pages. So if it has to be simple, I guess there has to be a really simple idea. And uh, here is the entire idea. So suppose, um, you know, imagine there are uh, the room next to where the seminar is being broadcast. There are lots of balls. And uh, we want to count how many balls are in that room. And uh, we trust Umang. So we are going to send Umang. And we Umang is going to go there with the uh, bucket. And what Umang is going to do is going to pick every ball with probability P. So uh, this is going to, the way the process would be that Umang goes to the first ball, tosses a coin with probability P. If it turns out heads, puts the ball in the bucket, then moves to the next ball, tosses the coin again with probability P. If it is head, then puts in the bucket and so on. And finally, Umang comes back uh, with K balls in the bucket. So at this point, I think it will be a good um, way to estimate k over p to be a good estimate of the number of balls in the bin. For this to be a good estimate, I mean, you can probably see that we, we had to comment a little bit about p. So if there are only 1,000 balls and we try to pick every ball with probability 1 in a million, then we'll probably not end up with any of the balls. So P should be roughly of the order of one over K. Uh, and then uh, this will be a good estimate. How can we prove that this is a good estimate? Well, we can rely on Chernoff bound where you have sum of random variables. Every random variable takes value one with probability P. You sum them up and uh, they are close to their expectation. So I think it will be Good place to stop and ask for any questions. So, uh, Kuldeep, hi. Yes, please. So, uh, in the version of the algorithm where M is unknown, do you incur an extra log n factor in the time and space complexity or you get the same running time? Um, then instead of, um, yeah, so there is another variant where we can replace the dependence on the log M uh, with log N. Okay. Yeah. So you said something about the choice of P to be intelligent. Yeah. Can you comment a little bit more? So, well, you can see that if, if P is really small, then we won't have any balls picked up. So K over P is always going to evaluate to zero. So P cannot be too small. And that's the only thing we want to worry about. I mean, if P is one, then we are going to end up with all the balls in the bucket. Uh, so that's something else to worry about as we go along. But right now, the only the thing that can really make the K over P to be a bad estimate is when P becomes really, really small. Okay. Uh, 
So, do you want Umang to see the number of balls before he chooses P? Um, so, suppose we could somehow intelligently choose P, then K over P would be a good estimate. Of course, as we are going to go along, we'll worry about how to choose P. Okay. Yeah. I'm also worried about a bucket. Like, I, I, like should I be worried about how big the bucket is? And um, yeah, that's why P can't be. Okay. Uh, can you please repeat? No, it's okay. I forget it. Okay. I... Yeah. Okay. So, well, if this idea has, we have to make it work, then what we really need is, um, let's go back to our setting. Uh, we should be able to pick, um, you know, we had these elements and we are trying to find the cardinality, the number of uh, the elements in this union of all these elements. So we should be able to pick every element of this union identically and independently with probability P. So if we could pick every element of the union identically and independently with probability P, then we'll be able to um, compute the size of the union. Okay, so let me kind of suggest a basic attempt. So here's what I think we can do. Uh, every time an element comes in uh, with probability P, we add it to our bucket. Hey, uh, Kuldeep, uh, I have a quick question. So, uh, yeah. so the number of balls in the bucket being K by P means that the lower the P, the higher the number of balls. Uh, sorry, I'm not fully following that. Should it not be KP? Um, well, I'm missing. no, no. So what we had is that we finally get to see how many balls there are in the bucket and we want to estimate how many balls did we start with. I see. It's the reverse problem. Okay. Yes. It's the, yeah. Okay, so um, also I just want to mention there are also no trick questions here. So uh, does this work? Uh, the idea that I just suggested here, we want to pick every element with probability P and the idea we have is that we can, every time an element comes in, we with probability P, we add it to our bucket. Let's look at the stream we started with. So we want to ensure that all the, the set of elements we have here are one, two, and four. And we want to ensure all the three elements are picked with probability P. Is that going to be the case with our algorithm we have here? No. No, right? Um, what goes wrong? Well, one gets picked up with higher probability. So what we want to do is to fix this issue. We don't want to pick one. Um, we would like to ensure that one and two and four get picked uh, with equal probability. Even though one uh, repeats five times, two repeats two times, and four appears only once. So let's see, what can we do to fix it? So perhaps let's concentrate the time when one appears again. So suppose at this point, we knew that one is not in our bucket. Okay. I have a question. What we need to, yeah. I have a question. How bad would it be if every time you see an element, um, you, if it's already there, you remove it. If it's not there, you add it with probability. If it's already there, we remove it. Yeah. And if it is not there, you add it. So, well, in that case, one will not uh, be in the bucket. So, yeah, no. I think that's a good. 
You put it with probability P, you don't do it with probability one. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I think that's a good observation. So um, let's let's come to that uh, in thirty seconds or so. So what happens when one is here? Um, well, if one was not in the bucket, then the probability one will be in the bucket after we process it is p. The trouble happens when one is already in the bucket. And uh, as was suggested that maybe what we should do is just remove one from the bucket and then with probability P, we can add one to the bucket. So, I mean, is, is one way to understand that you want the presence of a number in the bucket to be completely determined by the last time that number was processed. Yes, yes, exactly. So that's kind of the entire talk. <laughs> exactly. So you can see that what we should do is remove the element from the bucket. And then with probability P, we add it to the bucket. And now, whether an element is in the bucket or not uh, depends only on what we did the last time the element appeared in this stream. And for everything, there is um, you know, exactly one last time. So this will be a good point to stop and ask any question because this is kind of the entire talk. I'll just go through some analysis and all, but uh, this is all uh, we need. Any questions online as well? Okay, so well, um, we had to worry a, a little bit about this issue of P, right? So, we, you know, what about P? So, well, if P is too large, then the bucket will be too large. And that's not good. We don't want too many elements in our bucket. If P is too small, um, then we know that the size of bucket over P is not going to be a good estimate. So we don't want P to be too large. We don't want P to be too small. So what should we do? We can perhaps start with some value of P and adjust it. <clears throat> so what's a good value of P to start with? Well, it's a probability. So P equals to one is a good starting point, and then we can adjust it as we go along. So we'll come back to the expression for threshold. So what we do every time, if we had too many elements in our bucket, so let's say every time the size of bucket is threshold, we are going to decrease P to P by two. So this is where I want to uh, pause a bit and um, ask uh, the following thought experiment. Suppose we wanted to pick every element with probability P by two. And uh, we somehow went and picked every element independently with probability P. So how can we make it P by two? Well, what we can do is that we can throw away every element that we picked with probability half. And in that case, it would be as if we picked every element with probability P by two. So this is what we want to do. We want to adjust the value of uh, P. So which means that at every point, whenever we reach threshold, we are going to throw away every element 
identically and independently with probability half and we said p to p by 2. We'll come back to why uh, we get precisely the expression of threshold, but just want to point out the expression is 1 over epsilon square, epsilon square and log 1 by delta are natural dependence, and we'll talk about the uh, fact about log m. By definition, every element of B is in fact a unique element. Right? Yes, every element in B is unique. So by throwing away, you're actually throwing away what you have collected so far. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, well, let's try to do the full analysis to. Um, so what could have gone wrong? Well, the thing that could have gone wrong is the value of P becomes too small. So if you apply the Chernoff bounds, you will see that we don't want P to be less than one over epsilon square F zero. Because no, it's zero. F zero is the number of the elements. Yeah. In, right, okay. yeah. Right, because we don't want we want the average to be some or one over epsilon square. So we don't want it to be too small. So if we don't want it to be too small, so let's ask. So we want to compute. Um, we are going to denote an event bad i. So this is the event that after processing i elements, the p became too small. So what is the probability of bad i to happen? Well, for it to fall below one over epsilon square f zero, it should be as if we were picking every element with probability one over epsilon square f zero, and we still had more than threshold many elements. Well, if we were picking every element with probability one over epsilon square f zero, and then the maximum number of elements we can see is F0. So in expectation, we should be having one over epsilon square elements. But B is greater than threshold. And threshold is one over epsilon square log 8m by delta. So if we put it in the Chernoff expression, we get delta by 2m. So in expectation, we should be seeing one over epsilon square. But we are seeing the expectation times some log factors. So that's what in the Chernoff bound becomes e to the this vector here. And that gives us delta by 2. So, so in this calculation, m is just a proxy for f0. Uh, no, so M here, uh, we are going to come, no, M here is for, because this is happening at, after processing I elements, and we don't want it to go below one over epsilon square F0 at any point in the stream. So we'll have to take a union bound. Okay. Yeah. Also, at any point, let's say, what is the probability that B over P is not within the range one plus minus epsilon F zero? Well, again, we can know probability of error I and not bad I happening. Again, you apply the sum of uh, um, Chernoff bound on sum of IID variables. <laughs> Because B over P, the expectation we would have expected was F0, it's going outside one plus minus epsilon F0 becomes delta by 2M. And what's the probability this can happen at any point in the stream? Well, we do the union bound over all the points of the stream and we get delta. 
So something else I want to point out here is that not only we get the correct estimate at the end of the stream, we do get correct estimate at every point in the stream. So you can query the algorithm at every point in the stream and ask for it to give the estimate and the current value of B over P is a correct estimate. So we get a correct estimate at all points in the stream. In the streaming literature, such algorithms are called strong tracking algorithms, where you get a correct estimate at all points of the stream. And for such algorithms, log M is uh, sort of natural to have such dependence. <clears throat> okay. All right. So uh, this is kind of the entire algorithm. We maintain a bucket of elements with probability p. We add the element to the bucket if. Uh, the number of elements in bucket reaches a threshold. We throw away every element with probability half. We set p to p by two, and uh, our estimate at um, any point in the stream is b over p, the number of elements in the bucket over p. Any questions? For the, for, for the case when you don't know M, uh, you, do you just keep updating the value of like you start with the threshold and you update, you double it or something? Is that how you handle it? Okay. Um, so maybe I, I come to that uh, at the end of the talk. So there is a little bit more you have to do. So I, I'll, I'll come back to it uh, at the end of the talk. Okay. Yeah. That, that's a good question and it's just a little bit more to do. Okay, so, um, well, uh, you know, um, one of the strong motivations for us was that you get an algorithm that doesn't have to rely on hash functions and is also very simple to explain and implement. Um, but it also turns out that, uh, you know, simple things have much more power. Um, they also generalize. They can... Um, it turns out the algorithm I discussed uh, now generalizes to uh, the setting where instead of having an element, you, we could have had a set come in in the stream. And uh, now we are com interested in computing the union of these sets. So we had to talk about what kind of sets make sense to handle in uh, these kind of settings. So we are going to talk about sets which can be compactly represented. So their representation is logarithmic uh, in the size of the universe. And at the same time, these sets also allow three operations efficiently. One is the cardinality, that you can know the size of these sets. We can sample uniformly at random elements from these sets. And we can check for membership. So given an element, we can check whether an element belongs to a set. And these three operations, all of them can be done in uh, some time, let's say that is, it can be generalized to polynomial in the log of the universe. So one might be interested in asking, well, um, you know, what kind of problems uh, can be formulated in this setting. So I'm going to talk about three uh, different problems that can be naturally formulated. So the first is about computing the number of solutions of DNF formulas. Second uh, is Cleese made a problem, a well-studied problem for a long time. And finally, the problem of test coverage estimations. So I do want to remark that we got into all this because of the problem of test coverage estimation, which is a problem in software engineering. So we were trying to develop a tool and it was too slow. So that's how we ended up designing the algorithm in the first place. 
So let me talk about these three problems. So the first problem uh, that I want to talk about uh, are uh, DNF formulas. So we have set of Boolean variables, let's say y1 to yk. The space of the entire universe is all possible assignments to these Boolean variables. Now you can think about every set SI is implicitly represented by a term. A term is conjunction of literals. Literal is a variable or the negation. So suppose for now, let's assume that K was eight and we have a term that says not Y1 and Y2 and Y3. So this is representing all possible assignments to Y variables where Y1 must be zero, Y2 must be one and Y3 must be one. Okay, so there is a succinct representation of such a set. So all possible assignments where y1 is 0, y2 is 1, and y3 is 1. So let's ask uh, the question, does it belong to the Delphic family? Well, how can we compute the size of each SI? Well, it's really the size of each SI is 2 to the k and the size of each term which is the number of variables or the negation you see in each of the terms. Can we sample an element uniformly at random? Well, we know that every element of the term that we discuss here, y1 should be 0, y2 should be 1, y3 should be 1, and you can pick, assign rest of the variables uniformly at random, 0 or 1. Can we check whether an element belongs to the set? Well, look at the element, check if y1 is 0, y2 is 1, and y3 is 1. So all these three operations can be done in time logarithmic uh, in n, where n is the entire universe. So given the DNF formula, computing the number of solutions of DNF formula is computing the uh, cardinality of the union of these sets. Any questions? Okay, so now let me talk about a different problem. Uh, sorry for the basic question. What is the Delphic family? Ah, so we call a uh, Delphic family um, of sets if the sets have these properties that they can be succinctly represented and support cardinality sample, sampling and membership. Okay, this is just a name that's given to uh, this family of sets. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, um, now let's discuss another problem, which is Cleese measure problem. So here, uh, the setting is that we have axis parallel rectangles, and we want to compute the union of these axis parallel rectangles. We are focusing on the discrete version, so which is, let's count the number of integer vertices. So integer vertices is that for every coordinate, uh, the value should be an integer. So this is a fairly popular programming puzzle, usually given in two dimensional. You get lots of rectangles and you want to count the number of integer vertices covered by these rectangles. So the first thing is that each of these uh, rectangles can be succinctly represented because all in order to specify a rectangle, all we had to do is to look at the endpoints on every coordinate. Okay, so we can specify the endpoints on each of the coordinates. These are d-dimension rectangles, so all we need is um, 2D such uh, endpoints. Uh, but it endpoints. 
So does it belong to Delphic family? Well, we can know the size. How do we know the size of each rectangle? It's really bi minus one times in every dimension you take um, you subtract the length and you multiply all all the numbers together. How can we sample uniformly at random? Well, in every dimension, just choose a number that's between AI1 and BI1 and so on. How can we check an element belongs to such a rectangle? In every dimension, check whether they belong, the value is be, between AI1 and BI1. This also turned out to be a very well studied problem. There was a series of attempts um, and uh, some of these claims uh, later on turned out uh, to have inaccuracies. So this was an open problem when, uh, when we started working on this entire line of work. And uh, the problem was that can we design an algorithm for uh, in the streaming setting whose space and time complexity are polynomial in um, the number of dimensions as well as the maximum uh, size in each of the uh, coordinates. So this is now closed? Now, yes, I'm going to. Okay, so finally here is uh, the problem that we originally got into um, this entire setting. And this is the problem that comes from testing. So um, usually we design these as uh, software that are very complex. So they have lots of features. Um, the easiest example you can think about, you are sitting in an airplane and let's say pilot tells you that the pilot doesn't know what happens if uh, they press the button. Then you definitely don't want pilot to try it out midair. So what you want is that for every switch, you hope that somebody tested it once by turning it on and once by turning it off. Well, not for just every switch. We also want maybe for every combination of switches, maybe every three tuple of switches. And in general, what is called, we would like to have high uh, T-wise coverage. So every subset of size T, we would like to make sure that as many configurations as there were possible were tried. Usually you cannot try all configurations. Think about you are in a car, there are certain configurations that manufacturer tells are never going to work. So there's no point trying it out on those. So you also have some constraints over the configurations you can try out. And a very well studied problem. There's in fact an entire community and conferences around it is um, given set of constraints, can we generate a test suite that maximizes this T-wise coverage? What it turned out is that we were designing such a test suite generator and we found that we were taking a lot of time just to compute how much coverage it has attained. And it turns out that every test vector again satisfies the Delphic set properties and the problem um, that every test um, vector you can sample you can check membership and uh, you can check the size and uh, estimating the t-wise coverage again becomes a union of sets problem okay so at this point as i mentioned at the start of the talk there has been a lot of work in streaming in the past the issue is that all that work could only handle the case where every uh, set is singleton. Why so? Well, they strongly relied on hash functions. And uh, if uh, you take any of these hash function based approaches, then the time complexity you get becomes linear in the universe size. Why so? Well, these hash function based approaches, which are also called sketching algorithms, Crucially rely on the emptiness check where or the pre-image computation. So what we are interested in figuring out, is there an element of the set 
whose hash maps to zero. And doing such a check for these sets, uh, it's not clear how to do such a check that is uh, polylogan for uh, the kind of hash functions one uses, in particular the pairwise independent hash functions and so on. If each of the uh, sets were singleton, then doing such a check is straightforward. You just compute the hash and you can check if it's equal to zero or not. But now what we want to know is that from the given rectangle, is there an element that is contained within the rectangle that belongs to the rectangle and its hash also evaluates to zero. And the best known um, time bound we know is uh, doing a uh, linear in that. So again, I'm going to tell you a very simple algorithm that has the update and time complexity, which is polynomial in log M and log N. And the implication of this is uh, for the Cleese measure problem, we get the first efficient algorithm with linear dependence on dimension D. For model counting, we get an algorithm that has the that matches the optimal bounds in non-streaming setting as well. And it turns out the practical implementation is about 100 times uh, faster than the prior state of art. Um, because there's a huge difference in having an algorithm that has to store the entire DNF versus an algorithm that can just go over the DNF without storing it. And similarly, for the test coverage estimation, we get an algorithm that outperforms the currently used techniques in practice. As you can see, we are close to the end of the talk. So of course, I'm not going to tell you a new algorithm. It's going to be just the same algorithm that we had. So let's see, how can we make it work? Well, remember one, in our analysis, we never cared about an element being singleton or being a set. So all we had to worry about is how to make algorithm work with sets. So the first thing we did was that whenever a set arrives, we want to remove all the elements of the bucket that lie in the set. Wait, I have a question. Yeah. So in the setting with sets, is M now the sum of all the sizes or is M the number of sets? I, M is the number of sets. Okay. So the first step is that we want to. Do you have a bound? We had in a bucket. Do you have a bound have... of the sets? Sorry. Do you have an upper bound on the sizes of the sets? Yeah. So we again. Um, assume that all the sets um, are contained in the universe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. As I talked about in all of the settings, uh, that bound is very uh, straightforward in case of DNF formula, is the number of variables in case of, you know, D dimension rectangle. Uh, the maximum size in any of the coordinates and so on. Uh, so, Kuldeep, could, could here, when you say it's a Delphic family, even though an SI could be an arbitrary subset of 1 through n, we are somehow assuming that it is succinctly described in some way. Yes, yes. So, we talked about uh, all these settings, uh, right? In, a, in each of the settings, there was a clear, succinct description of each of the sets. Yeah. So the first thing we wanted to do is to check if an element, uh, we want to remove all the elements from our bucket that lie in the set. Well, what we can do is that we can go over every element in the bucket. We can check if it is in the set. And in that case, we can remove it. Now, we were going to pick an uh, Remember earlier we would pick the element, we would add the element to the bucket with probability P. Now we would like to simulate adding every element of SI with probability P. So 
So how can we add every element of SI identically and independently with probability P? One thing is that we could enumerate over all the elements of SI and then go over each element one by one. But in that case, the time will become again linear in N. So any guesses on what can we do here? Does it remind you of some uh, distribution that is well studied? So we want to simulate picking every element independently with probability P. If you pick every element independently with probability P, the number of elements we are going to pick follows the distribution, the binomial distribution. Yeah. Right? So first from the binomial distribution, we can pick Ni. And now we want to pick Ni distinct elements. Well, how can we pick Ni distinct elements? Uh, this is coupon collector. You repeat Ni log Ni times, we'll be able to pick them. Yeah. There is one minor pesky challenge that we want to worry about, which is that what if Ni is too big? Well, if Ni was going to be too big, what would we do? We would throw away every element with probability half. So instead of first going and picking those elements, we can just update P to P by 2 and resample Ni from the binomial Ni half until we are sure that Ni is less than threshold. Yeah. And at the same time also, Every time we update P to P by 2, throw away every element of B with probability half, right? Yeah. <clears> okay, <throat> hey, so that's kind of gets us to the final algorithm. We first sample from binomial. Then if Ni plus B size of the bucket is greater than threshold, then we resample and I from the binomial, we throw away every element with probability half until we reach a point where we are sure that we are going to pick less than threshold many elements and we can pick less than threshold many elements by doing coupon collector. Yeah. And uh, that's it. And finally, our estimate is that the, total number of elements we have in the bucket divided by P. As I mentioned earlier, um, well, to conclude first, um, here's a very simple algorithm that also generalizes to settings that prior hashing-based approaches could not handle. And uh, the algorithm is also uh, practically efficient. Uh, we have built tools around it, which work really well for very large uh, formulas, test suites, and so on. They also mentioned that, uh, which I'll, since Manal asked, I'll, I'll uh, be happy to go over the idea on how to remove the dependence on the stream size. There's also an open problem that I wanted to uh, um, end with. So that turns out to be an open problem in terms of the space complexity here. Um, so the best algorithm with the best space complexity we have is log square n. But given access to an NP oracle, remember the call for the, in case of hashing based algorithms, the check whether an element is in the set as well as its h of x is zero can be done in NP. So given access to an NP oracle, it's possible to have an algorithm with of log n dependence. So 
So there's a gap between log square n and log n, and that's an interesting gap um, to resolve in terms of the space complexity. Okay. So um, at this point, uh, I can go over a little bit about how to remove the dependence. So remember the dependence right now we have is log n times log m. How we can go from log n times log m to log square n, and then um, that will give uh, give way to the open problem that we have here. Uh, uh, but before we do that. Uh, I'll be happy to take other questions or uh, um, concerns that you might have. Uh, yeah, I have a quick question, Kuldeep. So you said uh, in the previous slide that you would use the coupon collector, uh, but yeah. uh, typically coupon collector can be used when all the uh, distinct elements are uh, have the same probability of occurrence. Uh, uh, do you happen to deal with cases where one of the distinct elements has an extremely low probability versus others, or is that something you don't encounter? Uh, we don't encounter here because um, the definition of sets that we described, every element has equal probability of, I mean, you can sample uniformly at random from the set. So every element has equal probability of appearing. Uh, every distinct element has equal probability of appearing? Yeah. Remember, we are just focusing yeah. on for every set SI, right? Right. So if you think about, you know, set SI, uh, let's see, maybe the DNF setting is the easiest one. So, you know, every element where Y1 is 0, Y2 is 1, Y3 is 1, everything else, if you set each of the Y coordinates with probability, half, zero, or one, then all of them have equal probability of appearing. Okay. Yeah. And uh, second question, uh, do you do any, uh, so is there a quick check? Uh, so it's not related to this problem immediately, but uh, if, if one is given a set, does, uh, does the check for whether it's a Delphic check uh, is that check easy or is it in poly time? Ah, that's a good question. Um, we haven't looked into the setting of the problem. So we have focused on assuming that the sets that are given to us are Delphic. Um, but yeah, because you had to agree on what the representation means. So we haven't looked into this. But uh, this is, of course, very closely connected to, uh, so let me remark that the algorithm can also be extended to approximate Delphic setting, where instead of getting the exact count of a set, you, you get an approximate count. And instead of getting a, a uniform sample, it's okay to get an almost uniform sample. And in such settings, you can see like a convex polyhedron, where you can compute the volume approximately and sample uh, approximately uniform, so those settings can be handled. So in some sense, for every class that allows, uh, that has an FP RAS for counting and sampling, uh, then we can compute the union of, uh, uh, you know, union of uh, the instance, I mean, every, for that corresponding class, if you describe the instance as the union of the sets, where each of the sets belong to that class, then we can compute the union, the size of the union in the streaming setting. Thank you. Um, so no more questions, then maybe we can take a look at the log M uh, factor. Uh... Uh, so it's also turns out this is also not very complicated. So let me So there is slightly different view of the algorithm I want to give now. We can imagine the way we were running the algorithm so far that uh, remember we had the bucket and the probability P. So maybe we are running 
lots of instances in parallel for a uh, um, bucket and p so the pairs of the bucket and p we are running all these instances in parallel so there is an instance with p equals to one there's an instance with p equals to half there's an instance with p equals to one fourth and so on okay but with one particular property that when, when an element comes in, the first thing we do is that we remove it from every bu bucket at every level, if it's there. And now we toss all the coins. So let's say the levels we are running are all the way till one by n. So we toss all these log n coins. And we add an element to the level corresponding to p equals to one fourth if the first two coins turned out to be heads. We add it to level corresponding to one eighth if the first three coins turned out to be heads. Okay, is this setting? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, so um, now what's happening, if you think about the current algorithm or the current analysis, we are saying that if you look at the level corresponding to 1 by epsilon square f0, at no point in the stream, the bucket at this level will be filled up with, you know, probability at least delta by uh, 2 or so, right? So that was the analysis. So at no point in the stream, with good enough probability, the corresponding level will be filled up. By filled up, we mean that it will have threshold many elements. So what it means is that since one of our epsilon square f zero will not be filled up, and the elements that are in p equals to half, all the elements that are in p equals to one fourth are also in p equals to half. Okay, so, um, you know, every element that is in the p equals to half or one fourth is a subset of the elements where p is half. I think so is the way we are doing these coin tosses are coordinated, right? So we are not going to add something in one fourth level if we are not adding it to half level. I think so, so, so in the first level for the p equals one. When the bucket gets filled, what do you do? Do you just stop that run or what do you do? Yeah, so now we have to talk about what what we should do with threshold. So let's say right now, um, if, if there's no bound on threshold, then you will just run the entire algorithm. But we know that if threshold is set to log m by delta 1 over epsilon square, then we know that the level corresponding to 1 over epsilon square f0 will not be filled up. Okay, but now for a given value of threshold, let's say what we will do, the moment it reaches threshold, we stop that level. We stop keeping track of that level. So what the algorithm is doing right now, it starts with the lowest level. And the moment the lowest level gets filled up, you start keeping track of the level above and level above and so on. Okay, that's that's what the entire algorithm did, right? Um, so for our, let's look at the correct level. By correct level, I mean the level at one by epsilon square f zero. So here is the thing: the estimate at this level will be correct as long as when some element comes for the last time the bucket is not filled up. Mm -hmm. So suppose we were looking at a slightly different variant of the algorithm where the moment the bucket is filled up, we, we can remove something from it, but we can't add it. So think about you have a fixed size of the bucket. If it's filled up, you can't add something to it, but you can remove something from it. So when some element comes in again, it's, some point in and the stream and it's in the bucket, you can remove it. And then there is again space in the bucket. Mm -hmm. 
So at one over epsilon square at zero, the correct the bucket at the correct level, the estimate will be correct as long as when the element comes for the last time, the bucket is not filled up. Because if the bucket was filled up earlier, we would have removed it anyway. So, yeah, sure, we, we couldn't add the element, but also we would have removed it anyway later on. So, we had to really take the union bound only over the last occurrences of the element instead of the entire stream. And since we had to take union bound only over uh, the last occurrence, there are only at most n last occurrences and you get a log n dependence. The bit of an issue now is that we can't stop keeping, I mean, now what will happen is that one over epsilon square, the bucket at the correct level will get filled up at some point. So we can't stop keeping track of it the moment it gets filled up. So we have to keep track of all the levels. So there are log n levels. And now we can have uh, the threshold to be dependent on log n. But also keeping, storing every element also requires log n many bits. So the dependence we get right now is log cube n. But actually there is just one more small observation. So again, let's go back to the correct level, which is one over epsilon square F zero. Well, let's say the element came for the last time and the bucket was filled up. But we also do a coin toss with probability P. So when we do the coin toss with probability P, if let's say the toss came out tells, like we were not going to add the element to the bucket. If we weren't going to add it to the bucket, it doesn't matter whether it was filled up or not. So what really matters is whether the bucket was filled up when the element came for the last time and we were going to pick it. And the expected number of elements that we are going to pick at the correct level are anyway one over epsilon square. So what turns out is that instead of log n, we can also just have a constant dependency. So now we keep track of all the levels, but in every level, the threshold is um, one over epsilon square log uh, one by delta. But since keeping track of an element also incurs the cost of log n, we get a dependence that's log square n. If you are familiar with hashing based methods, it turns out in case of hashing or the sketching, you had to only keep track of the current level because for every element, you make a decision once and for all. So you had to only keep track of the current levels. So there you don't get this log n dependence. But of course the issue with the hashing right now is we don't know how to do these computations uh, in polylog of the universe size. But what it also means is that under the NP Oracle assumption, which if you uh, translates to slightly weaker version of the conjecture of P equals to NP, we can get a algorithm with the uh, dependence of O of log n. So log square n is unlikely to be a, a correct lower bound for this problem setting. Thanks, Pradeep. Uh, any more questions for Pradeep? Um, have you thought about a version of this problem where you only want to count elements who occur more than um, some 10 times? Oh, that's a great question. It's um, funny. Someone asked me the same question yesterday. No, we haven't uh, thought about it. And I think it's a great question. Um, yeah. Uh,
um, I, I mean, I don't see, yeah, immediately making it work uh, with, uh, yeah, it's, it's a great question. I don't know the answer. But can you like first sample every element of probability one over 10 or would that be um, uh, Not. Would something on these lines be enough or not? No, I think I did try to think this morning on my flight, but uh, I didn't didn't look like it would work out. Yeah, I got an email yesterday from Ellen Borodin asking the same question. So I don't know. Okay, uh, let's sign fully for a very interesting talk. Um, thank you, so, yeah, uh, so I'll see you in Bombay or Hyderabad soon. Yeah, definitely. Thank you.